Come on. How could you know that? He could be on any damn cruise ship. What makes you think he's on that one? She looked up at the captain, and a smile broke from the corner of her mouth. Because it's a doomed cruise ship, and he's a magnet for trouble, McCall shrugged. They all looked up at the TV set and watched more footage. Well, detective, if you're right, we better get ready, Brant said, heading for his office. Toombs looked confused. For what, Captain? Toombs asked. Brant turned and faced them and smiled. The shit to hit the fan and a lot of dead terrorists is my guess. Steele had left the others downstairs in the safety of the crew's cafeteria. They would have questions when he got back, but for now, he had to find a way to the lifeboats. His plan was simple. If he couldn't go through the doors, he would go in from above. The silent corridors seemed surreal, almost like a bad nightmare. The air was musky from the lack of fresh air being pumped in from the air conditioning units. Steele made his feet impact on the ground a little harder to break the unbearable silence of the ghost ship. Slowly, he edged up the stairwell to the doors that led to Deck 6. His weapon held shoulder high and braced into his shoulder, ready for any surprises. The door slid open as he approached. Carefully, he made his way in, checking corners and listening out for chatter or footsteps. The silence was everywhere, and the shadows hung in the alcoves of the doorways of the rooms, like strange beasts ready to pounce. The thick plating below his feet muffled the thump, thump, thump of engines. Deck 6 was mostly comprised of the bars and restaurants which were situated at the center of the deck, with an elaborate open-spaced walkway full of tables and benches that had been fixed to the iron flooring. The walkway, unlike the others, was free of flora. This was the party floor that wound itself from entrance to exit. On the outside of the deck with the dimly lit corridors lay the smaller cabins which only took up one side, all of which were facing the ocean and all had balconies. Steele went to the first room and forced the door. Inside, a family lay huddled together, sleeping, with a look of contentment on their faces. He thought it was fortunate that no one had any idea what was going on. He moved quickly towards the balcony and slid open the sliding door. The drop to the deck was substantial. Plus, he needed a way back up, just in case his plan failed. Running into the corridor, he searched for the cleaner's room, where they kept the extra bedding and cleaning equipment. Earlier, he had taken notice that each floor would have one, just in case it became necessary. Steele smiled as he found the cleaning closet not too far down the corridor. With a massive kick, he was in. Steele stood for a moment and grabbed around half a dozen sheets from the metal shelving. Then, as he hurried back to the balcony, he began to tie the sheets together as he made a rope from the white linen bedding. The smell of starch crept up his nostrils as he bound the ends together, then securely attached one end to the balcony top railing. He climbed down effortlessly and was checking to see if there was any blast damage on the way. Steele turned and headed to one of the massive lifeboats. The enormous yellow beast was at least 30 foot long with a small window on top for the pilot. Steele ran forwards and peered inside one of the windows, then stepped back, so his back was on the wall of the ship, a look of complete shock on his face, which then turned to anger. He ran down to two more of the craft, and each one was the same. His gaze fell upon the ship, and his lips curled in an animalistic snarl. He wanted to find Black. He had questions, and Black would answer them.